Para presentar al profesor eh, Diogo Gómez, eh, paso la palabra al profesor Max Souza. Max, por favor. Obrigado, Juan. Bom, para o professor Diogo Gomes vai ser inglês, então eu vou fazer a apresentação em inglês. So, welcome everybody to this uh, next edition of our workshop. We have the great pleasure to have uh, to talk to us, Professor Diogo Gomes. Diogo Gomes has done his PhD with uh, uh, Lawrence yeah. Evans in, in Berkeley, and since so far has been done in all areas of uh, PDs and mathematics and now been working a lot of uh, new field games. And one thing that perhaps not uh, was well known as, as his PD abilities is that uh, Joe is also a master of Mathematica and tech, uh, among, among other things. And, uh, and it's my understanding that somehow he's going to blend all these skills and interests to that in his talk today. So Jogo, thank you very much for, for accepting our invitation. And now, and the floor is always yours. Our claims for PD, Diogo Gomes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice invitation, kind, uh, kind introduction. In fact, this is this is true. This is a this is a bit of a side business that that I that I run on um, symbolic computations. Uh, but in fact, all started because of real problems that we faced we faced on, on, on PDEs. Um, and, and what I, I want to describe to you is, is a little bit where uh, symbolic computations and algorithms for, for partial differential equations fit in, in, in my research and why we should think about, uh, about these matters. Um, so uh, this is maybe the first point is why algorithms in PDEs. Well, there are multiple tasks in, in PDEs, like finding, conserving quantities, uh, simplifying integral expressions, deciding whether expressions are non-negative, finding multipliers. You have a PDE, you want to multiply by something such that after integration by parts, you get some monotonicity formula. Or looking at discretization of PDEs and uh, asking, well, does the discretization preserve the same quantities or does the discretization dissipates the same the same quantities? All of these are are typical tasks that we face every day every day in PDEs, uh, or or quite often maybe, um, and these are well often tedious and error prone. Uh, if you have tried to find out a multiplier or integrating by parts such that something becomes positive. Um, you, you, you certainly agree with me that this is um, a source of errors. Um, sometimes it's quite complicated. Um, I, I would guess that most of us, if not all of us, really rely on heuristics and tricks of the trade to do these kind of things. So whenever you have one of these magic integration by parts, you kind of know what to do. You know what, what, what it works, what it does not work. But uh, in fact, as, as we'll see today, these computations are purely algorithmic and can be automated completely. So, so, so it's, not, um, it's, it's not a matter just of, of art. And, 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 and you can prove theorems about, uh, about these things. So um, now let me tell you that the, the, there are essentially three key tools uh, that we that we need to, to do all these things. And, and you'll see that there is really only one, uh, let's say non-trivial tool, which is which is quantifier elimination. Um, and, and if you're not familiar with quantifier elimination, I'll, I'll, I'll spend some time discussing, discussing that. A lot of what you do, let's say when you find uh, a conserved quantity is so, for example, undetermined coefficient methods. So the idea, let me increase mathematics. I'll be running a lot of code. And, and if you have questions, please, um, please ask. Uh, I'm not seeing your faces, so I have no idea whether you are asleep, puzzled, or so, so. So if you make this interactive, I think everyone is going to appreciate. Let's uh, give you a, an expression like this. Um, and you want to know whether this expression is zero. And, and of course, you need to define what are parameters, what are coefficients, and so on. Let's say um, x is a variable. So, so, and and I want to find 
the values are values C1 and C2, for which this expression vanishes for all X. Um, now, you see, this is a bit tricky because there are a number of cases. So, so if A is two, then you can factor these two guys together, right? If A is not two, then this term and this term are independent and, 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 and you can do it. So, so, um, a, a lot of the time that, that, and, and of the core routines end up being routines that, uh, solve problems like this. Okay, that uh, look at this thing and say, well, look, we take this expression. If A is 2, then you can select C1 as a function of C2. If A is different from 0 and B is different from 0, then, well, they are independent. So C1 and C2 is 0. Um, and, and then there are the, the, various, the various combinations. So, so this... Um, this kind of, of problems, in fact, is a problem on linear algebra, and, and in fact, it's a problem on finding basis of, um, uh, of, of monomials. So you have two monomials, and you want to find, depending on H, what is a basis for the monomials or, or the space generated by the polynomials x squared and x, x, x to the A. So a lot of the magic that you'll see in action later on um, it will boil down if you go inside the code and, 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 and you see what's going on to answering very simple questions. But of course, once you start complicated, complicating the, the number of things, then, you know, if your human tries to do it, you are not going to do it because you, you have better things, things to do. So, so one of the key tools that I'm not going to discuss, but, but I wanted to, to, to explain that's behind many of the symbolic computations both the ones done by computer and the ones that you do in your office is really things like undetermined coefficient methods, finding basis of, of polynomials. Um, and, 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 then, and then you have these two things, the variational derivatives and quantifier eliminator that I'll try to address um, late, later. Uh, now, there is a long history of work on symbolic computations for PDEs and um, Willie Herman and Chevyakov uh, have, have done a lot of work in, in this area. Um, I'll mention later on, but, but there is a, a really fundamental tool by Ansgar Jungel on systematic integration by parts. There is a lot of work on symmetries of PDs. Um, and, and by the way, what I'm talking about here is work on the computational side, not, not theoretical side. Um, now, one of the things that I will not be talking about, and, and, and there is a lot of work on that, is how to use symbolic computations to find solutions for PDs. Uh, the, the reason is that, well, uh, for, first there is a huge, a huge literature, and, and, and in a lot of what we do in PDs, you really want to understand the qualitative theory of PDs. So finding one particular solution, sometimes it's helpful, uh, but but really, it's not the end of, of, of the story. Um, so so in, in this work that I'm I'm going to describe, what we what we did was we developed a single package that automates routine computations in in PDEs. Um, as you'll see, it combines heuristic approaches and, and the things that we all know what to do. It, it's just that they were not formalized anywhere with really theorem-proving tools. And, 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 uh, and I'll explain. Um, and, and this is actually a long-term project. When, when I started this thing, I, I, I thought this would take me about one week to, to code, and um, it's not done yet. Of, of course, uh, of course, the, the specifications of what to be coded changed, so, so that's part of the reason. But um, but but it really starts by by something that that was kind of kind of small. So um, if if you if you know what quantifier elimination is, you probably can go to sleep for the next 10, 10 minutes. If you don't know it and it's the only thing that you learn. In, in this talk, then maybe you'll find it quite quite useful. Um, 
or, or maybe one day this will save you several months work and, and this is exactly where I started getting interested in, in symbolic computations so perhaps the, the first question is uh, what is quantifier elimination so uh, a quantifier elimination is an algorithm uh, that uh, allows you to transform quantified formulas into equivalent non-quantified formulas. Let, let me give you an example. This, this is easier to understand if you look at an example. Look at the, this first expression here uh, for all x, x squared plus y greater or equal than zero. This expression has a logical value that of course does not depend on x because x is a quantified variable, right? So the logical value of the expression for all x, x squared plus y greater or equal than zero, is a function of y. So the, the idea on the quantifier elimination is to transform a quantified formula that depends on x and y with an equivalent formula which has, well, no x and no quantifiers in this case. And, and, and it's easy to see that, well, if y greater or equal than zero, x squared plus y is greater or equal than zero. And uh, if y is strictly less than zero, then the first alternative will not, will not hold because uh, then you can choose x small. Uh, so, so these two formulas, the, the quantified formula and the unquantified formula are equivalent. Um, and you say, and I think the first time you, if you've ever seen this, I mean, I, 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 it's probably not that impressive uh, at at this stage, um, but but you'll see that this is a really really powerful uh, powerful uh, tool. Uh, now, there are many theories that have quantifier elimination. So so one is the real ordered closed fields, and this means that if you have an expression that involves quantifiers, logical connectors equal, less than or equal, addition, subtraction, and multiplication, uh, then you can eliminate the, um, uh, the quantifiers. And, and then you can also do in Boolean algebras and other, uh, and other things. Uh, why is this an important thing? Well, uh, the, the first importance, let's say, is that this is an algorithm, so it can be implemented and uh, this is actually the main reason that I'm using the, the software Mathematica to, to do most of these things, is that it has a nice implementation of the quantifier elimination algorithm for uh, real uh, closed fields. Um, in fact, we have many, many situations where we do quantifier elimination. It's just that, um, it's just that you may not notice. For example, if you look at the region defined by this set of three inequalities and you ask, well, when is this region non-empty? Okay. Well, it means that there exists an X. So, so for the region not being empty means that there exists an X and there exists an Y inside the region, right? But then this is a quantified formula that involves only, well, variables X, Y, A, equalities, inequalities, and so on, logical connectors. So it can be transformed, and in this case, it's very simple. It's, it's transformed into A greater than zero. So, so simple questions that we solve every day, let's say in calculus, are in fact questions in, in quantifier elimination. If you're doing multiple integrals and you want to know, well, when can I integrate when is, um, this is the kind of things. And, and in fact, once you look at this, you, what you realize is that a lot of properties on, on real functions can be are, are quantified statements. So if you look at the definition of continuity or monotonicity or convexity, this, these are all quantified, um, quantified statements. And there is one that's the, the last one, uh, that's, that's this thing, the existence of solutions of algebraic equations. Well, it, it, it means exactly this. For example, take, the, take a degree eight polynomial. There's nothing special about this polynomial. And I ask, when do I have a solution between minus one and one, okay? And, and you may say, okay, the, there is no way you are going to solve this problem 
because there is no resolvent formula. So unless you cooked up this, this polynomial in some very special way, um, I mean, th this, this thing is not going to be solvable. Uh, and, 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 and that's it. Well, it turns out that's not the case. You see, this is a quantified statement on polynomials. So the tarski seidenberg uh, algorithm tells you that you can transform into a non-quantified expression on the only free parameter, which is A. And in fact, uh, in fact, you see that A greater than minus 13 alphs seems to do the trick. And and this doesn't require you to solve the equation. I mean, the, 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 the really interesting thing about the tarski seidenberg theorem is that you really don't have to have resolvent formulas to, to make decisions about roots of polynomials. Um, and, 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 and this is important, for example, for looking at stability of dynamical systems. Many times what you want to do is to have the roots of a polynomial inside the unit circle. Well, but that's that's the kind of statement that that you can that you can address with this kind of kind of techniques. So so here it is a um, an interesting problem, uh, international math Olympiads problems, which is this: uh, you, you want to know for uh, you want to prove that for all positive reals uh, such that A B C is one, you have a certain a certain inequality. And you see, again, this is a quantified statement. So for all ABCs with product one, you have a certain inequality. This is a quantified statement. And this statement, uh, let me prove the theorem, and then we can discuss why I prove the theorem. Um, so, so I just proved the theorem. So, so what, what you have seen here, let me increase the font, and that we prove the theorem once more. Um, maybe let's some lines so that you, everything is at the same time so this theorem just has been proven um th this is this is a claim and, and 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 let me explain why well what is the proof of a theorem in, in in the end it boils down boils down to that well proof of theorem is an explanation why uh why a certain statement is true right and uh, and and this explanation uh, a reasonably uh, skilled mathematician should be able to follow the, the proofs that we do are really not proofs in the in the logical sense formal uh, formal formal logic and, and and really what this computation tells you as as a way of proof is this well take this quantified statement and it turns out that we've applied the tarski seidenberg algorithm to it this statement reduces to true and well if and, and 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 this is the proof and if you don't believe the proof well we can take the tarski seidenberg algorithm and go through the steps right many times in the proofs we don't prove every single thing you say take this equation solve it and you get this result and and, and, and you're actually not going through through all the steps so in, in in this sense which you may or may not agree i mean this um these formal computations, these symbolic computations, are proofs uh, in, in, in the sense that anyone, in principle, given enough time, could trace the, the steps of, of, this, of these algorithms. Of course, um, I would advise you against that, but that's... Uh, so so this, is, this is my, my quick introduction on quantifier elimination. Um, why is this important for PDEs? Well, it's important for PDEs because quite often you have uh, what I like to call parametric inequalities, uh, which are just a, a group of inequalities that have parameters. And, and here you find a couple of examples. So uh, you have inequality like holder inequality. There is a P and a Q and the 1 over P plus 1 over Q is 1. And if you look at the the constraint on the holder inequality is a polynomial constraint or a rational function which which for our purpose is more or less the same um you have interpolation inequality between lr and ls which is again parameters polynomial relations between the parameters such that inequality is hold sobolev inequality galliard nirenberg inequalities um 
so so what these inequalities have in in my in in common is that they have rational functions or polynomial relations between the parameters that ensure that inequality is hold. Um, now, a common method in PDE is to the, let's say the continuation method, or which is this, this idea that if you have a PDE, you prove estimates. Mm -hmm. And if you have estimates for the solution, then the solution exists. And, and of course, existence satisfies those those two estimates. Of course, this needs to be properly justified. But the critical step is this: Can we? You give me a PDE. Most often than not, if I can prove that if a, if there is a solution, the solution is bounded in some space, then the solution exists. So this is a, a general a general principle, and of course, um, it's a bit case by case. Um, and 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 this is the problem that we faced on mean field games, which is my main line of research. So after half an hour, there is the the, the promised PD. Um, so so this this was something I was doing with my student Edgar Pimentel, and we have a, a mean field game, which is a system of a Hamilton Jacobi equation, the first equation in the system and uh, the Fokker-Planck equation, which is the second equation in the system. And, 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 and there are a number of parameters. There is the parameter alpha, gamma, alpha, and so on. And our goal is to understand for which values do we have a solution. So for which gammas and for which alphas do we have a solution. Um, OK. Now, the the. The thing that's a bit non-standard, so hamilton jacob equations have been extremely well studied. Fokker-Planck have been extremely well studied. What it's non-standard about this system is that the hamilton jacobi has terminal conditions and the initial, the, the Fokker-Planck equation has initial conditions. So, so the way this system uh, comes up is a bit non-standard. So you really cannot use properties of the hamilton jacobi equation because you don't know m and you cannot use properties of the fokker planck equation because you don't know u um, now what was our strategy well these two equations are well very well understood uh, so maybe what we could do is to say well we look at the hamilton jacobi equation and we try to prove s or the fokker planck equation and we try to prove estimates for the Fokker-Planck equation in terms of solution of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And maybe we can prove with some power. Okay. Then we say, well, let's look at the Hamilton-Jacobi equation and let's try to prove some estimate with uh, uh, controlling the gradient of the solution with the solution of the other equation with M. And if you choose these spaces correctly, so this space and this space are the same, and this guy are, is the same, then you can combine. And you get an inequality where you control the norm of the u by the norm of the u. And the game is very simple. If theta 1, theta 2 is less than 1, you are controlling a linear growth quantity by a sublinear growth quantity. So automatically, the gradient of u is bounded in this space y. So what, what is the game here? Well, the game is that I didn't tell you what the x's and y's are, and I didn't tell you what these parameters are. But what you want to do is you want to choose this, this parameter, this space x, in such a way that once you have regularity in this space x, then you have all the regularity. So let's say take a high enough so we'll have space, take some large enough LP space, and so on. Uh, and, and 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 of course this is possible this this is is relatively possible because we know a lot about these equations individually so that's what we did and i'm not going through how to prove these estimates i'm, I'm just going to tell you how they look and it turns out that for hamilton jacob equations you have a number of estimates and and you can prove for example that the norm of u in l infinity is bounded by the norm of m in some crazy space that depends on the parameters. Where, well, there are some constraints because theorems uh, require you some things to be 
to be valid. You can do a similar thing for the gradient. You have, and, and, and you see what, what's, what's going on in these estimates is that they are getting worse and worse, right? There are more and more coefficients uh, showing up, more spaces, because you see you have the norm of u in L infinity by the norm of m in some space with some constraint, then the norm of u in L infinity shows up again, but now with a different power. Um, and, and you have a new constraint on, on, on this thing. And uh, then you go to the Fokker-Planck equation, you try to, to play the, the same game again, very well understood equation. And, and, and then you collect all these inequalities. And, and you see, uh, this doesn't look good. I mean, th this, this really doesn't look good because you have two parameters, alpha and gamma, which are given. You have uh, R bar, which essentially is the parameter that appears here that determines the space where we are getting the estimates. Um, but now you can select everything. I mean, alpha and gamma are given. R bar is the space that you get an estimate and you can select theta freely as long as you satisfy the constraints. But, but if you collect this thing, it looks like this. And, 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 and now, good luck, because, uh, you know, these are inequalities. Many of them are actually linear or, or, or linear in one of the parameters. So there are equalities, so you can solve some, some of these inequalities. This intrinsically, we all learn in high school how to do it, except that once you try to do it, it's, it's a complete nightmare. And, and this is where quantifier elimination is really useful, because you take these formulas, you put them into Mathematica, and you have your solution. Okay. So, so, so this is a fairly impressive thing, and this is again, this is an equivalence. So, so this is not an approximation. This is not um, a guess. It's it's an equivalence. So, the this statement here, the existence of R bar and theta for which all the inequalities are satisfied, only works if you have the precise range of parameters that I have in the in the bottom of my, uh, wait, maybe I stop, did I stop sharing or? Yes, no. that's, now it's back. Now it's back, okay. Okay, good. Because I press height, this, toolbar was was bothering me um okay now uh unfortunately what i showed you is is not the full story because actually in the papers that that we were doing we end up at some point with 16 inequalities in six variables or 25 in 14 quantified variables and 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 and, and the reason why we're doing this is because i mean there were some results that were already known and if, if you don't try to squeeze as much regularity for all the, the inequalities that you have, uh, then we're not getting there. I mean, we're actually getting worse, worse results. So at some point, what you decide to do is this, you, you stop thinking. You just write down any inequality that you can think about hamilton jacob equations, Fokker-Planck equations, and then you try to combine them in, in, in some, some kind of crazy crazy strategy and, and and i don't think i mean if you look at this slide i don't think you want to solve this kind of problems i i, I think this is this is really um something that humans would not would not want to to do um and and and, and but but again this 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 is a bit on on the side of, of our code that we have been we've been developing. Uh, the thing that we, we are mostly interested in is, in is finding conserved and dissipated quantities for, for PDEs. Uh, and again, this is another area where uh, this um, quantifier elimination plays an important, plays an important role, um, at least for the dissipated quantities. So let's say you have the heat equation periodic boundary conditions. So, so all the integrals are, are in, the, in the torus. So there are no boundaries. Uh, so, so often is, is important to find conserved quantities and dissipated quantities. And 
the question is how do we find those things um is and 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 if you, if you if you do a course on, on PDEs, the way you do it is just you stare at the equation and say, oh, you know, if you integrate both sides, the right hand side is a derivative, so it integrates to zero. So we have the first conservation law. But but this is really not that satisfactory once you have equations that are more complicated. Um, so. But, but finding these quantities is an, es an essential uh, task in the theory of evolution PDs in this case. I mean, energy and entropy are typically conserved or, or dissipated, and these quantities control the size of, of the solution. So existence implies the well-posedness. And, and, and again, except for simple examples, the computation is really a tedious process. And, and, and if you don't have a good guess, I mean, it's 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 something that doing it by hand is quite quite painful if you have done this this kind of computation, which I'm sure you you have. Um, so this is where the 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 second tool that that I talked about, the Euler operator, the Euler Lagrange operator, uh, shows up. Let's say you have uh, an integral quantity and you perturb it and you differentiate with respect to this perturbation parameter and, and set epsilon to be zero. Well, this is what's called the variational derivative or the Euler operator. And this is the L, the representation with respect to the L2 inner product of the derivative of the functional associated to Q. Um, and, 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 and of course, if the functional does not depend on uh, derivatives is just a derivative, but if it depends on the der on first derivatives, you have one integration by parts and and, and so on. Um, I, I assume that you are all familiar with uh, with this. The, the interesting thing is that well, you you are probably quite used to use the Euler operator, the Euler Lagrange equations, the zeros of the Euler operator, um, to find necessary optimality conditions. Mm -hmm. But it's not the only use. I mean, the Euler operator is really a directional derivative or gives you a directional derivative. So if you have an evolution PD and you want to compute the derivative of an integral quantity, you can actually represent this using the Euler operator. So and, and the good thing uh is, is that now this is a purely algorithmic algorithmic quantity so if i want to compute uh, a derivative and i have an implementation of the our operator then i can just just compute it and let me just show you uh so i have uh so let me explain a little bit on syntax here uh so, so all of these these functions that we coded somehow have these variables which are the state of the world and the actual expression. So we humans uh, kind of understand if you look at u of x square that, well, u is the dependent variable, x is an independent variable, and maybe I just need to tell you that I'm solving the heat equation so that the right hand side, uh, sorry, that this right hand side is u x x. Uh, but for a computer, I actually need to specify anything. So I need to specify the dependent variables, the independent variables, the right hand side, and, and all of this goes inside the variables so that the, the, the actual operators is, is this one. Um, and, and this is exactly what we get, and no surprises there. Um, now, the interesting thing is that this is not the only use. Whenever you integrate by parts, you are actually, what you are doing is really adding a divergence. And divergence are what's called no Lagrangians, meaning that the difference two expressions are equivalent by integration by parts. If their difference is independent, or the integral of their difference is independent on you. But that's exactly what's, what's a no Lagrangian is. For example, if you look at this expression and this expression here, well, they are equivalent by integration by parts because you can you can just integrate, but you can actually detect that 
by computing the variational derivative of the difference. Okay. So we have this fundamental procedure to obtain, let's say, uh, interesting identities in uh, PDEs, which is you, you take some integral expression, you integrate by parts, and you get some, some useful identity. And in fact, this is an equivalence relation. And the way whether you can detect that is by computing this, this Euler operator. Um, so you see, if you have a conserved quantity, the time derivative of its uh, integral is zero, but the time derivative is e of p times n. So again, my equation is ut equals n. I always omit the time, and n is the right hand side of the equation. Uh, so there is no time in the in the in the variables to simplify the notation. But of course, there, these are time dependent equations. Um, you look at this and you say, well, but if I want this thing to integrate to zero, I want this thing to be equivalent to zero. So I need the Euler operator of this right hand side to be zero. And that's exactly what we are what we are getting. You, you guys can see my mouse, right? When I move my mouse, you guys can see it, right? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, good, good. Because uh, you know. Just a question though. Uh, just let me know that we're not the screen. That's that's just, just uh, if that's the one it's okay. Sorry? Uh, you, you're not free when you went back you, you're not going through it you didn't came back to free screen just to let you know that I'm not in full screen not anymore oh this is weird I'm I, I was in full screen my my computer thinks that and and is it now in full screen Max yeah, now it is yes okay for me yes, it was exactly it the same that is it is yes I was sorry. yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so so to detect if a, a quantity is conserved, what you need to do is you take the quantity, you apply the Euler operator, then you multiply by the right hand side of the equation, then you apply the Euler operator again. And you see, this is a linear condition on P. So let me show you an example. Um, and, and, and if this is a linear condition, then we can search for, uh, let's say, conserved quantities using a basis. And this is what we are uh, doing here. I mean, we are using a, uh, in, in this case, I, I'm using polynomials up to degree two because that's the default. So, so again, the heat equation, and I'm finding a basis of conserved quantities, which are polynomials of degree two, and I can actually check that the time derivative is, is zero. Um, I'll come back to this. I'm using this beautify option uh, because if you just compute the, the second derivative, you get u double prime. Um, and, and, and if you're a PDE person, you know that the integral of u double prime is, is zero, let's say, on the periodic domain. But actually, uh, I'll, I'll explain how we can, we can simplify these expressions uh, later on. So another example is, let's say, I take the heat equation, but now I look. I want to look at second derivatives. Now, if you look at the variance of the heat equation, um, of a solution to the heat equation, the variance grows linearly uh, because that's that's the variance of a Brownian motion, for example. Uh, so grows linearly in time. So if you take the second derivative of the the variance, you get you get zero, and in fact we can find that the second derivative of integral of u of x the integral of x u of x of the integral of x square u of x is is zero so i'm, I'm using second time derivatives um so we can find we can find this this basis of conserved quantities or in this case they are quantities that that are second order um I mean, you, you, you can play this game with, with a number of other equations, like hamilton jacob equation. I'm, I'm skipping the computations. Uh, I'm, I'm just sh show some things that, that we found um, quite useful. And, 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 you know, if you look at the radio Hughes model, that's probably a, a nice example because, you know, it's, it's a, this is a, uh, sorry, uh, where I am. The Hughes model is kind of nasty in the so the Hughes model is a model for um, uh, for population dynamics, 
And the equation is kind of nasty. I mean, it's 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 a, a first order PDE. It probably admits a conservation law, but there is this singularity two over R. And and if you really are interested in computing one, and and let's say you you want to run a code and you want to check your if your code is is doing uh, is doing the right thing, it's it's not such a nice thing to do. For example, here we are computing um, using polynomials up to degree 11. Uh, okay, and, and you see the, the um, in, in the end what we are doing is this, we are looking at all linear combinations of, uh, it's not monomial dependence. We are looking at all linear combinations of these guys and ask what can you find which linear combinations of this um i don't know how many but we can compute 78 terms uh actually are non-trivial so so one, one thing that we check is that that they are non-trivial conservation laws and um and their time derivative is is zero and then finding I mean, this is only a linear equation. It's just a, a big linear equation, uh, and 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 certainly it's not the kind of linear equation that you want to to solve. Um, so so this is really what what we did for for this thing. It's it's a simple linear algebra. Um, now it's it's linear algebra well done, and and this is um, this is something that's nice to appreciate because. We are handling parameters uh, carefully. For example, if you look at the KDV equation with parameters alpha and beta, what happens is this. Well, if beta is zero, it's, this is actually not the KDV equation. It's the Burgers equation, which has a lot more conservation loss. If alpha is zero, then it's called the Airy equation. If alpha and beta is zero as well, everything is conserved because the right hand side is, is just zero. So if you want to, to find this, and, and in this case, we are looking at polynomials up to degree two with two derivatives, we, we, we get all the different cases, you see? We, we get all the, um, all the different cases depending on the values of alpha and beta and, and so on. Um, now, more interesting is dissipation. And and I, I also have an example with uh, Zakharov, uh, who's Netsov equation, which is a two-dimensional equation. So so this code works with systems, um, equations that that are second order, uh, high order, uh, multiple variables, and so on. Uh, so more interesting is this: is you want to figure out whether certain quantities are dissipated. And, and, and this is a much trickier, trickier situation uh, because, well, you see, finding that something is zero is just solving a system of linear equations. Because again, the condition that you have on some quantity being conserved is a linear condition. So really to find polynomial conservation law, what you need to do is to solve a set of linear equations. But show that quantities are dissipated, you actually need to show that, well, you take the time derivative, then there is a right-hand side, and this right-hand side in this case is, is negative, okay? So what you need to do is you want to find a P and a Q such that the time derivative of P is equivalent to Q and, and it's zero, but you also have, I mean, typically you want P positive and Q less than or equal than zero. This is, this is the situation. And, and, and this is again, something that can be, can be automated. Um, and, 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 and you can do it in, in, in multiple ways, but, but this is kind of the, the obvious, the obvious algorithm. Um, let me show you with one example what's what's involved in in this thing, and 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 then you can appreciate why we care about automating these these processes. 
Uh, so let's say you have a ET equation again. And I just decided to consider P to be of the form AU square. So, um, and, and actually, because I know the result, it's enough to consider Qs of, of uh, that involve first and second and second derivatives. Uh, I mean, in, in general, the, the game that, that you need to play is with a lot more coefficients, right? Because, um, so, so, well, check that P is greater than zero. Well, it's, well, A1 greater or equal than zero. Then you have a linear system that tells you that the derivative of P is equivalent to Q. Um, okay. And then you have an inequality for uh, B. And actually, this gives you that B2 is less than or equal than zero. And, and you get, by combining everything, you get the, the usual dissipation of um, L2 norm for the for the heat equation. Uh, now, let me go through the the, the building blocks of, of these things because it's it's probably probably worth uh, going. So so one of the building blocks that we have is something that's a bit on the heuristic side. Um, I mean, it, this is rigorous in, in the sense that it does what it's supposed to do, uh, but but it's not guaranteed to, to to produce positive or negative expressions. So you have an integral expression you'd like to simplify, and and when when I'm talking about simplifying, generally what I mean is you cancel whatever can be cancelled, mm -hmm. and you try to write this expression with a positive or or negative or definite sign. And, and surprisingly, uh, you, you know, you don't even need quantifier elimination. You just need two operations in, in a lot of cases. Not all, but, but in a lot of cases, this, this just works very well, which is this. I mean, look at this expression here. Um, and, and we have periodic boundary conditions, right? So this guy, this first guy, is the derivative of u square. Uh, so a derivative integrates to zero. So this guy integrates to zero. This guy, I can integrate by parts by moving one of these derivatives to the left. Um, and then I cancel and I get ux squared. Now, uh, so, so I think any, any person that has done this kind of estimates knows what to do. Uh, the question is how what, how do we code this? And how do we tell a computer what, what how do we explain what we, what we do? Um, well, in, in fact, this is comprised of two, um, two, two types of, uh, of, of, um, of operations. One is if you look at this expression, Uh, if you look at this expression, you, you look that it's comprised of three monomials. And these three monomials, uh, you can look for a basis of these monomials. But now, instead of looking for a basis with respect to the standard, um, you, 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 you get an equivalence relation that tells you, well, two monomials are equivalent if their variational derivative is zero. So, so you are computing a basis on a quotient space, and you realize that, well, in fact, these three monomials are linearly dependent model of integration by parts. I mean, they the, the span a one-dimensional space in this quotient space. That, so, so we are looking at linear combinations of these guys. But you are saying, well, but any two linear combinations are equivalent if their difference has zero variational derivative. Uh, and 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 this is this is what we are computing. We are computing the, a, a representative of this basis, and in fact, we use this to represent um, our uh, our original expression as a linear combination of well, this guy. Because there is only one. Um, 
this gets even more interesting if you have parameters because if you have parameters uh, again is this idea that you know if a is one then it's we are in the same setting as before um but let me ask a question to the audience uh before i run this so let's say i'm integrating this expression dx uh, i can safely remove this guy because it's going to integrate by zero to zero how many different cases do i need to consider for a does anyone think that I need to consider five different cases for A? Four? Three? So someone unmuted. If you unmuted yourself, you need to answer, even if it's wrong. But maybe I shouldn't, right? Oh, no, you cannot. <laughs> so, so let's see. Um, I mean, it's 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 not so easy to this is as simple as it gets right you have a parameter and you want to know what kind of expressions do i get by integrate by parts and what kind of simplifications do i have right and and, and in fact there are sorry I forgot the parameters if you don't tell the computer that there is a parameter well the computer doesn't know that there is a parameter. there are in fact three cases so when a is zero this is u double prime that integrates to zero when a is one well this guy cancels with this guy and in all the other cases you cannot do anything i mean there is there isn't you cannot represent with fewer terms you can try to integrate by parts but but you will not get any cancellation okay. um So, so again, th this is a simple algorithm in, in, in linear algebra. Uh, the, other, the other thing that we, we can use is this symmetrization uh, procedure. So the idea is that you have an integral expression and most often than not, if you want to rewrite it in a way that's positive, you integrate by parts trying to balance the number of derivatives. Um, let me show you an example where this thing holds. For example, this is actually a good example. Oh, sorry. First example, you have u and you have four derivatives in one side and zero on the other side. So what you do is you start moving derivatives until you get to a symmetrical expression. And this is what, what we implement in this integrate by parts operator. Um, now, let me show you an example, which is something called displacement convexity. So, so this, this was a real use of this, of this problem, uh, which, which then we proved with more generality. But uh, So you have this mean field game, which is a system of two equations, and we have what's called planning boundary conditions. So you have m at the beginning and m at the end. u does not have boundary conditions. Everything is periodic in X. And what you want to show is, or want to give conditions for which the integral of U, some function U, uh, is uh, greater or equal than zero. Now, if you believe the formula that's on the bottom, and if I tell you G is increasing and U is convex, then and M is positive, M is a probability measure, then everything here is, is oh positive uh, everything here is positive g is increasing and u is convex and in fact we can check this and we can get the well let's let's first get what you get if you just differentiate this is what you get and and most likely this is not exactly what you get because you expand everything and you've got this crazy expression and then you need to start staring at it and see can i integrate by parts in some way that stuff cancels other stuff right um and 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 this is not obvious at all um but just by applying the two 
algorithms that that we had before you get exactly the the representation that we have in the in the paper so so automatically you can uh, get a much simpler expression and most often than, than not this expression if it's if it can be represented in a positive way it's it's positive um, now in general this may not be enough and 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 this is something that Ansgar Jungel um, created which is this idea of systematic integration by parts so what you do is if you have an expression you can divide the expression in lambda times the expression one minus lambda times well the expression and integrate one one of these things by parts and leaving waving the other you can consider all possibilities and then why would you do that well because you can look at this expression on the right hand side and say well but now this is a polynomial in lambda u uxx and ux and i can use quantifier elimination to find uh, conditions for which this polynomial is positive or negative in this case um, let me show you uh, and and what is the the problem well the problem is that this thing tends to create long expressions and by the way long I don't mean this thing that's right now on the screen this is actually rather short so the expression u double prime times v square is equivalent after integration by parts to the expression that's now underlined for any choice of real parameters a1 and a2 but then after disintegrating what you want to do is we want to check positivity and uh, and and to check positivity well, in principle, you can do it by quantifier elimination, but but it's really slow, and and really slow means that quantifier elimination, if I'm not mistaken, is like a tower of exponentials on the number of variables or something like that. So 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 it's completely so so so. In fact, we spent some time um, developing algorithms that check for necessary positivity condition, um, and 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 our key algorithm is something relatively simple which is this you you go to the highest order coefficient and then you say well if it's odd like x cubed then x cubed cannot be uh i mean let's say you look at the first polynomial here for this polynomial to be positive well the term in x cubed must be zero right uh, so a is zero but if a is zero then you have a polynomial in x square but then the the coefficient in b in, in x has to be zero so you apply this thing and you immediately get well the only polynomial that can be positive and in fact the polynomial that we have there it, the only possible choices of parameters that ensure that are compatible with positivity are a equals zero and b equals one now um Let me give you uh, just one more example. So, so let's say I start with a polynomial like ax to the fourth plus, so this guy here, right? Um, well, if you look at this polynomial, then the linear term needs to be zero. Uh, the linear term needs to be zero. And then you, you, you can use quantifier elimination to actually give you necessary and sufficient conditions for positivity and it turns out that this polynomial here is non-negative provided that b is between zero and one okay uh this is uh okay let me just give you one last example i have a couple of examples but this is uh, actually one of the examples due to ansgar jungel on systematic integration by parts um, and the idea was well you take the thin film equation and you want to find for each values of alpha and beta a certain quantity is uh, decreasing um, well and you look at this 
and uh, let me just run it for for a little bit and let me show you what's going on so this is the time derivative this is the result of the disintegration so for any choice of parameters a5 a6 a30 something you you get that this quantity uh, is equivalent to the time derivative you apply necessary conditions and you get a much simpler expression I mean, it still looks kind of nasty but but you know compared to the original one it's it's kind of big and in fact using quantifier elimination you get you get the desired desired result uh i mean one, one of the the real uses new uses for this was in fact to this displacement convexity for mean field games with with congestion and and this this was um something that we also did but but i think i'm clearly over my time so this is a good point to to stop questions thank you joe thank you very much for this very nice talk very uh symbolic talk let's say also. <laughs> and uh, so the questions uh preguntas So uh, okay. I actually have a, a few questions. So I start with one. If uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, you, you you've done everything in in periodic boundary conditions, which is yeah. is nice. But uh, how? Uh, uh, and I'm sure that it, I mean probably can include boundary conditions. But uh, how how easy is how easy to do that? And uh, do the, this change? Uh, the efficacy and the, you know the, how your uh, algorithms work depends depends on the kind of boundary conditions that you have because um, uh, yeah I and mean, the the thing is this if you have a the, in in all these symbolic computations somehow the difficulty is how to represent the um, the data in an efficient way and in a way that's rigorous enough to, to the computers to understand what or and access to the information that they need to, to do correct correct transformations um, and and not to be cumbersome uh, and and this is a bit of the the problem with boundary conditions if you're just saying there is way boundary conditions then you you may be able to get away with things but then it's not too general. The, when, once you put boundary conditions, you want to do um, maybe more general boundary conditions, and, and that's you know it's it's more of a technological issue. It's it's not really a mathematical issue. It's it's how how do you represent boundary conditions in in a symbolic language that are that contain all the information that you need and are not too cumbersome. Okay, thank you. So because our, our notation is, is usually vague. I mean, if, if you think about what we do when we do mathematics, is there is a lot of information that you have that, that computers don't. So when you write Laplacian, you know what it is, and you know that it's a Laplacian in X or Laplacian in Y. And and and, and if you if I give you the normal derivative, then you, if you need coordinates, you can get the coordinates. But um, this is the kind of issues that you face. Okay. Okay. Uh, just as if the audience has any questions, uh, preguntas. Okay. I have one last question. And um, do you think that you can this algorithm can can evolve as to become a you know, uh, I, won't, I won't say a theorem checker or prover, but a theorem prover, but like kind of uh, you say, I, I give you a, a sequence of estimates. The algorithm can actually check that uh, from one line to the other line is it's uh, is, the is actually correct. I don't know. This will get you the estimate from the first line to the last line in one step. Ah, I right? see. This this is really what what this thing does. You, you you don't check line by line. You 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 look at this this equation this inequalities that I have, right? I mean, this thing gives you everything at once. Um, I see. And, yeah. 
Okay. I mean, oh. the, yeah. All right. Uh, except that if you have some, okay, uh, I see. Uh, for the parametric inequality that you show, okay, I see, and probably if you have some other conditions, then you have to, to somehow program that in the, into, the, into the operator. Or something. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, if there are no further questions or preguntas, questions. Okay. So thank you very much, Diogo, for thank this you. very impressive talk. And I'll hand it back to, to Juan. For the next uh, for the next speaker and everything else. Obrigado, 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 Obrigado. 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 Ob